If you would, open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 8. We're going to be in Luke chapter 8, verse 40 this morning. It is always a delight and a pleasure to be back at Dallas Bible Church. Uh, Though I'm from West Virginia, every time I walk through this door, it does feel like coming home. Uh, So many of you were so impactful and instrumental in my life and drawing me close to Jesus Christ. So I'm just glad to be here. Uh, Luke 8, 40 through 55, we are going to read through this. And then we will bless the word of God, and we'll study it together. Verse 40. Now when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue. And falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house, for he had only a daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. As Jesus went, the people pressed around him, and there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for about 12 years. And though she had spent all of her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment, his his being Jesus' garment. And immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, Who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds surround you and are pressing in on you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had immediately been made healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. While he was still speaking, someone from the ruler's house came and said, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. But Jesus, on hearing this, answered him, Do not fear, only believe, and she will be made well. And when he came to the house, he allowed no one to enter with him except Peter and John and James and the father and the mother of the child. And all were weeping for her. But he said to them, Do not weep, for she is not dead. She's sleeping. And they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But taking her by the hand, he called, saying, Child, arise. And her spirit returned, and she got up at once, And he directed that something should be given her to eat. And her parents were amazed, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. Now let's pray. Father, we are thankful uh, to be among your people today. We're thankful to be uh, in the church on a Sunday morning. We are grateful for all that you've given us in 2023. We anticipate goodness in 2024. We ask that you would illuminate our eyes as we read scripture, that you would show us the truth of who you are. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. My wife, Tori, turned 30 about a year and a half ago. And one of the unfortunate habits we picked up while living in Dallas is we really like to spend too much money at restaurants. Um, So it seemed fitting that we would go to New York City for her 30th birthday. You can spend a lot of money at restaurants there. Um, I, I was trying to be a good husband ahead of time. I was researching different places we could go to eat. We did have a limited budget, but I wanted to splurge at a couple places. And I found this place uh, called Bellman's. There's these books called the Madeline books. Are you guys familiar with these? Some of you nod. They're like about a girl that lives with a bunch of nuns. Um, but they're be- beautiful books. They're illustrated and written by this guy named Bellman. And, and my wife grew up reading them. She, she loves them. She reads them to our sons. And there is a, a restaurant in a hotel lobby in New York on the Upper West Side called Bellman's. And it's called that because he, like, drew all over the walls. He did all the illustrations, all the decorations in the restaurant. So I thought, hey, this would be a great move. I'll take my wife there. It'll be like eating in one of her favorite books. And so I was going to surprise her. Um, We got up in her hotel. We took a subway. It's a whole thing in New York. Um, Walked across Central Park. We had bagels. We went to the the Met. Great day. Very sweaty. Um, Show up at Bellman's. That That will become important in a second. Show up at Bellman's, and I walk in the door. I don't know if you've ever, like, walked into a door where you just immediately know you don't belong. (laughs) <laughs> like, uh, um, there was a guy sitting in the restaurant who, I mean, just was a different type of rich, right? Like, like uh, Daniel Day-Lewis and There Will Be Blood. Like a guy that's a magnate or a tycoon of some kind. I don't know. 
looked like William McKinley. And, um, and I just knew every, like his clothes were more expensive than my house, you know? And so I'm just immediately like so insecure about like, do I belong in this place? And, uh, and I find out very quickly because I go up and I talk to the maitre d' and I'm like, hey, I'd love a table for four. Or, you know, my wife, it's her 30th birthday. My in-laws are with us. Can, can we get a table for four? And he does one of these. <laughs> no, I can't do that. He just says straight up, no, he's not going to give me a table. And I was like, oh, come on, please. Can you, you know, it's, a, it's an important day for us. We're really excited to go here. We, we came all the way across the city. And he's like, I'll see what I can do. So he talks to his manager. And y'all, he walks us down the longest hallway. Like, we are walking for five minutes following this guy to our seat. Takes us to another room, sets us at a table across from these dudes from Ohio. Which is funny, because, like, as a West Virginian, like, he just saw us and was like, yeah, you belong across from Ohio. Um, and they are dressed like me. Uh, and uh, I wore open-toed shoes. I wore Chacos. Um, <laughs> you guys laugh like you know, yeah, you shouldn't do that. I didn't know that. Like, I just, I wore Chacos, you know, it's a nice walking day. And um, had I checked the, the website ahead of time, I would have seen, like, yeah, no open-toed shoes. I think you even had to wear a jacket. And, like, I was way off from that. Um, you know, a long list of things you had to do to eat at this fancy restaurant. Um, I, I mention this story, I tell this story just to illustrate the fact that there are some places that you enter that have an explicit code of belonging. There is a list of things you have to meet to be there. Those, those places are relatively rare. Bellman's was one of them. No open-toed shoes. You want to wear a shirt with a collar. You want to wear a jacket. You want to bring your best there. That's what you must do to belong in a certain place. More often than not, the code of belonging is implicit. And what I mean by that is there is a list of rules that signify whether or not you belong in a group of people. That is true just about everywhere you go. That is true at a family gathering at Christmas. If you show up without a shirt on, fellas, at your grandma's house for Christmas, she's probably going to say, you don't belong here. I don't know your family. Maybe she wouldn't. Um, if you show up at work and you're not wearing any shoes at all, they're going to say, go home, put on some shoes. There are different lists and codes of belonging that may be written or unwritten that determine whether or not you belong in a room. And today, we are going to look at a story that tells us, as the people of God, what it takes to belong. What is that unwritten or written code of conduct that we, as followers of Jesus, must meet to belong? And as we're thinking about that question, as we're thinking about what that answer may be, I think it's important for us to process in the book of Luke what is happening in this chapter. This chapter is an insane chapter. Luke 8 demonstrates a wild 48 hours for the disciples. Two days prior to this story, Jesus grabs the boys up. He says, get in the boat. I'm going to teach you a lesson. They get in a boat. They begin to sail across the Sea of Galilee. These are men, some of whom are professional sailors and fishermen. And while they're sailing across the Sea of Galilee, a storm arises on the ocean. And the Bible says it's a storm unlike they've ever seen to the point where they fear for their life. They're very afraid. But in a few moments, they're going to continue to be very afraid, but not of the storm. Because Jesus speaks, and the storm stops. Luke tells us that they look around at each other, and they're terrified. And they say, who is this man that even the wind and the waves obey them? That's the picture that Luke gives us of Jesus in this chapter. And we see these stories occur multiple times over and over again, where people see Jesus for who he is, that is, he's not like us. And one of two things happen. Either they push him away. You are not like us. We're scared of you. We don't belong with you. Or they draw in near. And we see that when the disciples get to the other side of the lake. They, they get to the other side of the lake to an, an area of, of the, uh, the region called Gennesaret. It's a primarily Gentile area. And they meet a man who's a scary dude. Like, that's the only way to put it. He, he lives in a graveyard. He cuts himself with rocks. He's possessed by demons. And he screams all night long. And Jesus sees this scary dude. And he speaks to him. And he's sitting and he's in his right mind. And the same thing happens where people look at Jesus and they say, We're not scared of the guy. We're not scared of the storm. We're scared of you. 
And Luke says that the people of Gennesaret gather around Jesus and they beg him to leave. Because again, they behold Jesus as who he is. And they say, we don't belong with you. And you don't belong here. We don't know who you are, who sent you, but we need you to get away from here. So they push, they push away. They know they don't belong. They know they've shown up at the restaurant with open-toed shoes. On the other hand, we see the man who is healed who goes to Jesus and he begs him to stay. Please stay, please stay, please stay. Let me serve you. And Jesus sends him on mission. So we see that push and that pull. Push away from Jesus, pull into him. Those are your options when you see Jesus for who he is. They get back in the boat. They sail across the sea. Verse 40 picks up in our story. When Jesus returns, the crowd welcomes him. Let's not gloss right by the crowd. It's important when we interact with Jesus in Scripture to know that there's no such thing as a crowd to him. These are people who have gathered. They have desperations. They have wants. They have needs. They have dreams, desires, anxieties. They have families. And every one of them is known to Jesus. And I say that to you today because y'all are here the week after Christmas. You are here because you want to encounter Jesus. And you all bring unique baggage and unique situations with you here. And Jesus knows every one of them and they are precious to him. With Jesus, there is no crowd. And they've been waiting beside a sea. We don't know how long they've been waiting. Maybe they've been waiting for two days. We don't know. But they come and they welcome him. They're waiting for him. In verse 41, there came a man named Jairus. Here we meet an insider. So again, y'all are here. You're the, you're the faithful ones that come the week after Christmas. Every church has insiders. Every group of people has insiders, people at the core of the community. Jairus is one of those people. And um, you, can pre- you can typically pick them out pretty quick who they are. I could probably name like five names right now as to who like the insider is at DBC. And y'all would be like, yeah, that's them. Most of the time, they're actually not staff at church, I found. They're just people that say yes to everything. So if you want to be an insider, volunteer in the preschool department. Um, uh, they are at every body of, of people. Every church, every family, every office has, has insiders. And that's not bad. There's no value statement to that. That's just how communities work. A lot of times it's a reflection of leadership. Jairus is one of those insiders. Luke says he is a ruler of the synagogues. Now that phrase... It's a little ambiguous. We don't know exactly what that means. Mark's a little bit more specific when he he uses a word that implies that he's maybe setting together the service of worship. So that means in his community, in his community of Jewish people in the first century AD, he's the one who books the rabbi. He's the one who uh, determines what prayers are prayed, what songs are sung. He is the center of the community. If your daughter is sick, he's showing up at her house. He's praying over her. If, you have, uh, if, you're, if you're missing employment, he's the one who's organizing the community to bring you food. He is at the center of his community. So it's no surprise that when Jesus shows up and there's a crowd of people waiting for him, that Jairus is ushered to the front. Get Jairus up there. Get Jairus up there. Jairus has always been there for us. Get Jairus to Jesus. Get him the rabbi. Get him the teacher. Because, verse 41, or verse 42, he has an only daughter about 12 years old and she's dying. Jairus is a desperate man. And it's funny how it doesn't matter if you're an insider or an outsider. Desperation can bring you to your knees. It's worth noting that Jairus is a faithful religious leader. A lot of times we look at Scripture and we talk about the Pharisees. And we talk about the religious leaders of the time. We talk about them pejoratively. And that's fair for a lot of them. But Jairus is a faithful religious leader. He's humble. He falls on his knees. And he begs Jesus to come to his house because he's desperate. I would imagine in a room this size, I could be wrong, but I would imagine. In fact, I'm not wrong. I know this to be true because I know some of you. There are people in this room that have lost children. We walked very closely with a family member who lost a daughter this past year. There is no desperation like that desperation. And so Jairus, in desperation, falls at his knees and he implores Jesus to come to his house. For he has an only daughter and she's dying. And as Jesus went, the people pressed around him. That's to be taken seriously. That looks, not, that looks like not a big deal in the book of Luke. Mark tells us that they're pressing around him to a point where they are about to crush and kill him. 
Think about that. That's how desperate this crowd is. We have been waiting for Jesus. He is here. Get close, get close, get close. And in that desperation, Jesus grabs Jairus by the shoulder and he says, You're with me. Come with me. We're going to your house. And up to this point, the story has gone rather quickly. We see in all the chapter, of chapter 8 of Luke, we see a quick tempo. He's going to places. He's going to another place. He's going to another place. There's a storm. There's a man with a demon. And all of a sudden, the tempo slows down. When Luke does that, it's our cue as, as students of the Scripture to see that he's pointing out something specific that takes our attention. You may think you know where this story is going, Luke says. There's one very similar to it two chapters ago that I told you. But we're about to go somewhere else entirely. Verse 43, there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And though she had spent all of her money on physicians, she could, be, she could not be healed by anyone. Here we meet the outsider. The outsider is a little bit more difficult to find. I could name five outsiders, and you would not know whether or not I'm correct, because you probably don't know their names. In fact, it's interesting, all three synoptic gospels record this story. No one says her name. There are perhaps good reasons for that. I tend to think it's because no one bothered to ask. Outsiders show up to church on Sunday. Sometimes they don't look quite the same. Sometimes their family structure may be a little different or their, their, their earning power is a little different or the way they talk is a little different or they have an illness or a handicap that separates them. Uh, they just don't quite fit in. They flit about the edges and they're a lot harder to see. Jesus sees them. This woman has had a bleeding disorder for 12 years. Uh, I, when I prepped this sermon, I didn't know it was a family Sunday. So let he who has ears hear. We're probably talking about a uterine hemorrhage. Um, so this disorder this woman has, it comes with a great deal of embarrassment. And I, I think we need to dwell on that for just a second. Consider this is a time before cheap and disposable feminine products. What that means for her is her lifestyle would have been significantly hampered. This is also a time where the job of a woman in the household is intensely physical. It often involves agricultural labor. It involves lifting, carrying, keeping fires going, skinning animals. I mean, this is, this is a heavy job for this woman. And her disorder would have made it very difficult for her to complete this. Consider the laundry. Consider the amount of washing she would have to do uh, for her clothes, that, that she bears this disorder on, how much time that would occupy. It's also worth noting that if this is a uterine hemorrhage, which most doctors think it is, she probably would have been struggling with infertility. Many of you have struggle, struggled with that very thing. It's an isolating, isolating thing to struggle with. In addition to that, it was also something that came with a great deal of stigma in the first century world. There are um, tomes, of debates that rabbis had as to what constituted a biblical divorce in the first century. Like our culture, they were also obsessed with divorce. Many rabbis taught that this was a reason to divorce. If you can't have kids, you should find another wife. We don't know whether or not this woman is married. We don't know if she has already had kids, but we know that this would have made her very vulnerable in her community. Also, it's a time that's obsessed with fertility and it equates it to morality. So you think about uh, when, we, when, when the disciples ask about the lame man, and they say, who sinned, this man or his father? That same equation is placed on women who are struggling with infertility. Who sinned here? What did she do wrong to struggle with that? Now we know that's not biblical. They didn't think so. But all of that pales in comparison to the struggle she would have borne for the past 12 years, and that is the struggle of cleanliness. Um, for some of you who may be new to church or new to the Bible, this, uh, this concept may seem very strange. I'll admit it's strange to me, but in the Old Testament, God had a code, a written set of rules that dictated whether or not you could participate in cor corporate worship with fellow Israelites. And that was known as the cleanliness code. Most of the cleanliness code is more about uh, hygiene than morality. And, and a lot of it, you know, wasn't evil. The violations of the cleanliness code were often neutral or sometimes good. So for instance, if you touched a dead body, let's say you're tending to a dying grandparent, and they die. 
and you happen to touch their body. According to the cleanliness code, you would have to do some ritual washing, go speak to a priest before you could be among the people of God again. Um, not a big deal. Might take a day. Might take a little bit longer. Uh, it could be taken care of. But you were precluded from the gathering if you violated the cleanliness code. Not a big deal. Other violations were a big deal. This is a big deal. Feminine bleeding was considered a violation of the cleanliness code, which meant that for the past 12 years, she wouldn't have been allowed in this room. To make matters more complicated, she wouldn't be allowed to touch anyone coming to this room. If she did, they would not be allowed to join in corporate worship. So the feasts, the festivals, the visits to temple, the visits to tabernacle, to the synagogues, these are things that are, she is precluded from. And for 12 years, she has watched life continue while she's unable to gather to belong with the body of God. She's an outsider. Uh, Luke does an interesting thing here. He calls, calls our attention to a detail. How long has this woman been struggling with this? Twelve years. How old is Jairus' daughter? Twelve years. This is not arbitrary. This is a strange thing that Luke is doing. It's odd when a gospel writer tells us the amount of years someone has been struggling with a disorder or a disease. It's odd when they tell us how old a child is. And I think what Luke is doing is he's pricking our biblical imaginations to draw a distinction and a parallel comparison between these two people, the consummate insider, Jairus, and the consummate outsider, this woman. So 12 years ago, Jairus' wife became pregnant. And 12 years ago, about the same time that this woman was to begin her family, Jairus has a beautiful baby girl. And the woman watches as this girl grows older in her community. She walks, she talks, she plays games, she turns six, she turns seven, she turns eight, and she grows into a beautiful young woman. And all the while, this woman watches this and she thinks about, where's my beautiful young woman? And maybe that's conjecture. It's a little bit of imagination. But I wonder how many of us have dealt with a similar thing. Um, teens who are here today, uh, I have teenage sister and bro brother-in-laws. The, the comparison on social media is brutal. It's brutal. Watching as people's lives take the turn that you want yours to take and you're left out. For young adults in this room, watching your friends get married, have kids, find the job that you want, while well, your life staying still is brutal. And it's isolating. It can make you feel like an outsider. And for adults here, the same is true. And I wonder what this woman would have felt, what she would have known to be true as she watches Jairus and his daughter have the perfect little family. But the strange thing is, here at the feet of Jesus, they are the same. They are united in desperation. So verse 44, she came up behind him, him being Jesus, and touched the fringe of his garment. I love the honor of this woman. She knows she's not supposed to touch Jesus, but maybe I can get away with touching his clothes. And she touches the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge of blood ceases. Look what happens there. We, the readers of Luke, would expect Jesus to become unclean. We would expect him to be touched and say, whoa, 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 hold on. I got to teach in synagogue tomorrow. You see all these people. How am I supposed to deal with them now? I got to go, go wash myself, show to a priest. But that's not what happens. The opposite happens. Instead of Jesus being made unclean, this woman is made clean. Why is that? It's because, and this is what I would love for you to bring into the new year, because with Jesus, closeness is cleanliness. Closeness is cleanliness. If you talk about the code of belonging among the people of God, what Jesus' requirement is, is closeness. Closeness is cleanliness. I have a brother who um, I, I share a small group with who uh, had, had a wild few years before he came to Christ. 
And we were talking about this the other night as we were studying scripture together. And he said, I just remember in college, like seeing all the Christians that I admired and just thinking how much I wanted that. I just wanted so bad to have a life like them. I wanted to be like them. And I'd try for a while to kind of change things. And I just could never do it. And I wish I could go back in time to old Carl and shake him and say, dude, just go. Just show up. Just be with Jesus. Be with God's people. Because so often in my heart, and I think in many of our hearts, we have this misconception about what cleanliness is. I want to tell myself, in order to be near God, I've got to stop the bleeding first. So some of you are looking forward to 2024, and you've maybe set spiritual goals for yourself. Maybe more time in the scripture, more time in the word, more time dwelling with the Holy Spirit in prayer. And and these are all great goals, and maybe you want to improve yourself so that at the end of the year you can be a different person. But I would caution you with this. Know that God does not require you to change who you are to be near him. Instead, he will change who you are by being near him. You see what I mean there? There's a distinction, right? Like with Jesus Christ, it's in being close to him that we're made clean. And that's what happens to this woman. She touches the, the, the fringe of his garment and she's immediately made clean. In verse 45, Jesus stops. He's had a busy day, but he stops And he says, who was it that touched me? When all denied it, which is insane, because they're nearly crushing him to death, Peter said, Master, the crowds surround you and are pressing in on you. Now Jesus said, no, 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 no. Someone touched me because I perceived power going out from me. This is an interesting thing Jesus is doing. He could have just gone along his way. Uh, I I would imagine that in the course of Jesus' miracles, there are passive healings that take place. We hear about in Scripture, and he healed many people, right? Quote, unquote. We also see in the New Testament, the book of Acts, where the disciples and the apostles' shadows are falling over people and they're being healed, and there's not necessarily an exchange. Jesus could have just let this woman go and just let her be whole. She got what she wanted, and he could have continued to Jairus' house, but he doesn't. He stops, and he says, who touches me? In verse 47, When the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling. There it is again. They see Jesus for who he is, and they're afraid. And falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she'd been made clean. Think about that for a second. Luke doesn't tell us those details. The woman tells us those details. She tells us what her disorder is. She tells the crowd what has been wrong with her for 12 years. And it's embarrassing. And Jesus has called her to that. And some of us might look at that and say, that's kind of cruel, Jesus. Why couldn't you just let her be? But what Jesus knows is what this woman wants may not be what she needs. What she wants is to be healed and to go on her way. But what Jesus knows is she needs something else entirely. She needs to be claimed and adopted. So what he says to her is, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. So this woman whose name we do not know is a daughter of Jesus. For years, I thought I could have a content and wonderful relationship with Christ privately. So I remember I started reading my Bible faithfully at a point in my life where I was desperate for Jesus. And I would do it every night. I would pray every night before I went to bed. And that was my relationship with God. And I felt close to Him. But if you want to know where the real secret sauce is in following Jesus, like if you really want to be close to Him in 2024, you do it in here. You're close to Jesus publicly. That's what Jesus wants of you. He does not want you to be privately close to him. He wants to publicly proclaim you as one who is with him, as one who belongs. I had um, a brother uh, who I had a friend crush on, a brother in Christ. (laughs) makes it even weirder if it's just a brother. Um, uh, Years ago in Huntington, and um, he was a believer, and we would get together early in the morning and read scripture together. And I say this, Christians are always trying to get up early with me. (laughs) I am not my most godly at 6 (laughs) a.m. If you want to read scripture with me, great, meet me at lunch. Um, But we would get up early and we would read scripture and we'd pray together. And um, uh, and it was kind of this sort of stilted, sort of strange thing. I don't know if you've had those relationships with people in church before where like, you want to be close, you want to be accountable, you want to pray together. First, it's a little awkward, and it was like that for maybe a couple months. And then at one point, Dustin 
looked at me and said, um, I got to confess. Okay, sure. Like, this is kind of what we do. We keep each other accountable and we confess. And he said, no, like, I really got to confess. And for the next 45 minutes, he just poured out his heart. And there are certain sins that are acceptable to confess among believers, and even certain embarrassing ones. These were not those. These were sins, these were things like, I am so envious I can barely breathe. When I scroll through Instagram, I want people who have more than me to have less than me. I have been jealous of you, Zane, and here's why. I have wished harm upon you because of this. And those are the kind of confessions that when we bring them to Jesus in the presence of other people, God honors that. And so I can clearly see my friend Dustin and say, you are a child of God. And now what's required of me? And so I just, we are crying and I looked at him. I said, okay, my turn. And then I went. And after that exchange, we were no longer two people who theoretically followed Jesus. We were people that needed Jesus desperately. And we knew that of each other. And we've been close for the past decade because of that. And so what I would encourage you today is if you want to be close to Jesus, if you want to know what Jesus requires of you to belong, I would say do it among each other. Let him call you out in radical vulnerability like he did this woman with brothers and sisters in Christ and be close to him together. He heals this woman. He says to her after she explains her story, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. He gives her what she needs. He publicly adopts her. She is whole. Now people can look at her and say she does belong at synagogue. I remember what was the deal with her before. No longer. She's our sister. But remember, we have another story going on here. Closest is cleanliness. And at this point, Luke begins to pick up the tempo. It's a little bit quicker. And we get back to our original story. And he says in verse 49, while he was still speaking, see the verb tense there? It's fast. While he was still speaking, someone from the ruler's house, that is Jairus, came and said, your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. So before the word daughter can come out of Jesus' mouth fully, Jairus' servant comes and says, the other daughter, Jairus, your daughter, the one we did not stop for, the one we were trying to hurry and get home to, she's dead. Don't trouble this guy anymore. And again, that reaction. You saw what this man can do. You saw what Jesus can do. You push away or you draw in close. You push away or you draw in close. And that is the option that Jairus is given. There is a voice in his ear that says, don't trouble this guy. Look at all these people. Your daughter's dead. Come home and be with your family. But the beautiful thing that Jesus does is he doesn't give him a choice. He pulls him in close. He says, do not be afraid. Only believe and she will be made well. Uh, death is... Death has a way of cutting to the quick of what matters. It has a way of emphasizing what is important. I said this during the first service. I wrote, I wrote something down here to share. I don't really know how to share it otherwise, except to say this past year has been the hardest year of my life. So shortly after I moved back to Huntington, my father was diagnosed with cancer. He died this past spring. And it was brutal. I mean, it was a lot. A couple months later, my sister-in-law, who was 20 years old, also died. I remember when I got the phone call that my dad was sick. We live over by the Ohio River. It's a pretty large river. Runs around Kentucky and West Virginia and Ohio. Um, I remember getting the call and knowing that my dad was going to die. And I remember walking over to the river and looking across into Ohio, and this might sound weird, I don't know, uh, I just felt led from the Holy Spirit to ask, like, Jesus, will you walk across the water and will you hold me? And that's really all I wanted. And through the next year, which was very difficult, as my dad got sicker and my sister-in-law got sicker, uh, I would return to that spot and it's like, it's not a beautiful river. There's like shopping carts and diapers and needles and stuff, you know. But to me, it became very beautiful. Because I would go there and I would ask Jesus to hold me. And he did. And as I returned there and returned there with people and brought people in that space with me, 
I found that my love for Jesus was growing warmer and warmer. If I'm honest with you, for the past decade, my love for Jesus has been cooling. And the sad thing about my heart over the past 10 years is that though I was reading my Bible and praying and serving God, I began to consider myself more of an employee of Jesus than a brother and a son of the Father. But it's really funny. As I drew near to Jesus, uh, the things that I cared deeply about before I no longer cared about. I no longer cared about what my future in ministry was. I no longer cared about what controversial book I needed to read. I no longer cared about who said what dumb thing about what president on Twitter. X, I don't know. Um, I didn't care about those things. What I cared about was being near the person who can raise to life the lifeless body of my father. That's what mattered. And Jairus, the consummate insider, is brought to that same place. I've always been an insider in church. Like, there's places that I felt like an outsider. This is not one of them. Jesus does not care about your insider status at Dallas Bible Church. What he wants is to be close to you. And my, my caution to you today, you who come to church the week after Christmas on New Year's Eve, y'all are the insiders. My caution to you is this. In 2024, do not confuse your relationship with Jesus with your insider status. Prioritize closeness to him above all else. Closeness is cleanliness. And that's what we see in this passage. So Jesus wraps his arm around Jairus, and they begin to walk towards his house. And I don't know what's going on in Jairus' mind here. For me, I probably would be pretty frustrated about the crowd and the bleeding woman. Jairus seems to be a little bit more faithful than I am because we don't see any of that. And they get to his house, and his daughter is growing colder in her room. And when he came to the house, verse 51, he being Jesus, he allowed no one to enter with him except Peter, John, and James. There's already a group of insiders among the disciples. Again, not a value statement, just the way things are. And the father and mother of the child. And all were weeping and mourning for her. But he said, don't weep. She's not dead. She's sleeping. And they laughed at him. Verse 53. These people have seen dead girls before. They've dealt with this. This is a time when this happens pretty frequently. Jesus, this girl isn't asleep. But taking her by the hand, verse 54, he called saying, child, arise. And her spirit returned and he got up, she got up at once. And he directed that something should be given her to eat. Dying is hungry work. And her parents were amazed, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. I'd like to ask the band to come ahead and come on up. We have in this story, we have two diametrically opposed people. We have an insider and we have an outsider. We have the one uh, who should feel very at home with Jesus and the one who should not. And the irony of this is, is in their desperation, they're brought to the same place. And that is closeness at the feet of Jesus. My encouragement to you, my encouragement to you is as you look forward to this year, prioritize your closeness to him above all else. It may take doing something really scary. It may take a radical vulnerability or confession in front of people that you don't or do know. But it's worth it. Luke, in this passage, has shown us that God is making a people who are united in very little except for their dependence and radical vulnerability with their son, with his son, Jesus. You are among those people, and I would encourage you to enjoy it. Closeness is cleanliness. Let's pray. God, we are um, humbled to be here near you and near your people. I am humbled and very thankful to be counted among the body here. Um, we ask humbly as we enter the next year, knowing that this next year is going to be very difficult for many of us, that you would allow us to be near you. That like Jairus, you wouldn't give us the choice to push you away. That upon seeing you and who you are, terrifying and beautiful, we would have a radical desire and desperation to be close to you. And may we know the joy that comes from that. It's in the precious name of Jesus Christ that I pray. Amen.